hey a very good evening aspirants now before getting into discussion i have an interesting announcement for you tamil nadu government has made an announcement in the 2023-24 budget to aid civil service aspirants tamil nadu government is planning to provide cash incentives to help civil service aspirants for assessing better coaching facilities and materials as part of this initiative thousand civil service aspirants will be selected every year through a screening test and the selected candidates will be provided rupees 7500 per month for 10 months to prepare for the preliminary examination those students who clear the preliminary examination will be provided a lump sum amount of rupees 25000 the tamil nadu government has allocated rupees 10 crore for this initiative tamil nadu skill development corporation will implement this scheme in coordination with anna staff administrative college It is a good opportunity for your aspirants. We will update you about the screening test when further information about this initiative is made available to the public. With this good news, now let's get into the daily Hindu news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 21st of March 2023. Displayed here are list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. And a kind request to you all, those who haven't yet. subscribe to our youtube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button to get regular notifications regarding our current affairs videos now let's get into our first news article discussion now look at this article here it says that india hosted a conference last week on shared buddhist heritage under the ambit of shanghai cooperation organization the aim of the conference was to reestablish transcultural links This is by seeing if there is any common among the Buddhist art of Central Asia in various museums collections of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries. Okay, this is about this article given here. Now, in this context, let us use this opportunity to quickly revise few points about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. See, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is shortly known as SCO, is a permanent intergovernmental international organization. SCO came into force on 19 September 2003. Now let us see the organization's main goals. Firstly, SCO works to strengthen mutual trust and neighborliness among the member states. Secondly, SCO works to promote their effective cooperation in politics, trade, the economy, research, technology and culture etc. Thirdly, SCO make joint efforts to maintain and ensure peace, security and stability in the region. and finally seo aims to move towards the establishment of a democratic fair and rational new international political and economic order know that the seo comprises of eight member states now who are they they are china india kazakhstan kyrgyzstan russia pakistan tajikistan and uzbekistan apart from this the seo has four observer states they are afghanistan belarus iran and mongolia okay This is about SCO, its goals and members. Now let us learn the working of SCO. See, the heads of state council is the supreme decision-making body in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Heads of state council meets once a year and adopts decisions and guidelines on all important matters of the organization. Then there is another body which is called SCO Heads of Government Council. This council also meets once a year. they meet to discuss the organization's multilateral cooperation strategy and priority areas to resolve current important economic and other cooperation issues see seo heads of government council approves the organization's annual budget know that the seo's official languages are russian and chinese apart from these two councils the seo has two permanent bodies one is the seo secretariat which is based in beijing and the second one is executive committee of the regional anti terrorist structure that is rats which is based in tashkent now you will see in brief about seo rats see seo rats that is seo regional anti terrorist structure is a permanent body in the shanghai cooperation organization seo rats had made a significant contribution for combating terrorism separatism and extremism at the regional and global levels see as part of the rule making activities The rats developed SCO conventions on countering terrorism and extremism. Also know that the SCO rats is holding the annual joint anti-terrorist exercises since 2006. In this particular exercise, they provide practical training on response and interaction of competent authorities like those who provide border services. 
see all these are done to neutralize terrorist threats and to prevent terrorist attacks so we can say that the seo rats ensures the security of seo member states from almost all forms of transnational crimes associated with terrorism okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about shanghai cooperation organization that is seo its goals then we saw about the members of seo then we moved on to see about the working of shanghai cooperation organization and finally we saw some points about seo regional and terrorist structure now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this editorial displayed here it talks about the recently concluded india's un sc membership know that india served as one of the non permanent members to the united nations security council from january 2021 to december 2022 for a two year period so in this context only this article is written know that the author of the editorial is mr tirumurthy who is a former ifs officer mr tirumurthy served as the indian ambassador to the united nations during india's unsc membership see this editorial article deals with some of the efforts taken by india during its two year membership of the united nations security council so in this discussion we will see the important points provided in this article now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can go through it now firstly let us look at the structure of united nations security council see the united nations charter of 1945 established the united nations security council which is shortly known as unsc see unsc is one of the six main organs of the united nations the other five organs include the general assembly the economic and social council the trusteeship council the secretariat and international court of justice except international court of justice all other five organs are headquartered in new york city and note that international court of justice is located at the hague in the netherlands now particularly talking about united nations security council the primary responsibility of unsc is to maintain international peace and security now coming to the members of united nations security council the unsc is composed of 15 members these 15 members include five permanent members and 10 non permanent members five permanent members include china france russia the united kingdom and the united states these five countries are collectively called as the p5 countries see the p5 countries has a special veto power by using this veto power any of these five countries can veto a resolution in the united nations security council this means that if any one of the five permanent members cast a negative vote in the 15 member security council the resolution or decision would not be approved okay this is all about permanent members now moving on to see about the 10 non permanent members see the 10 non permanent members are elected for a two year term by the united nations general assembly unlike the permanent members of united nations security council these non permanent members do not enjoy any veto power these non permanent members of the council are elected on a defined pattern that is five members are elected from african and asian states then one from eastern european states and two each from latin american states and western european states okay this is all about membership of unsc and note that the united nations security council's presidency rotates on a monthly basis among its 15 members know that india acted as the united nations security council president for the months of august 2021 and december 2022 apart from all this a representative of each of the members of united nations security council must be present at all times at united nations headquarters so that the security council can meet at any time as and when the need arises okay this is all about the background of united nations security council now moving on to see about india's contribution during its two year period as the non permanent member of united nations security council as i said earlier india served as one of the non permanent members to the united nations security council from jan 2021 to december 2022 so we will see the india's contribution during this two year period as a non permanent member see india's focus area during its membership were the maritime security terrorism un peacekeeping reformed multilateralism and the global south now first let's start with india's contribution towards maritime security during its membership know that indian prime minister modi directly chaired the united nations security council meeting on maritime security the meeting dealt with freedom of navigation anti piracy and combating terror and transnational crimes at seas and oceans 
and at the end of the meet a presidential statement was issued with direct reference to united nations convention on laws of the seas as the international legal framework with respect to maritime security this is all about india's contribution towards maritime security now moving on to see about counter terrorism initiatives taken by india during its membership as we all know taliban occupied afghanistan in the august month of 2021 so india as a non permanent member of the united nations security council steered the negotiations regarding the taliban takeover of afghanistan in the council the negotiations finally resulted in adoption of united nations security council resolution 2593 This resolution 2593 dealt with issues like stopping cross border terrorism from Afghan soil then protecting the rights of Afghan women minorities and children and providing humanitarian assistance apart from this India was also successful in listing the name of Abdul Rahman Maki to the sanctions list maintained under United Nations Security Council resolution 1267 know that Abdul Rahman Maki was the former chief of the Lakshari Taiba now coming to UN resolution 1267 The resolution 1267 allows any UN member state to propose the adding of the name of a terrorist or a terror group that has affiliations with Al Qaeda and ISIS to a consolidated list and the list is maintained by the 1267 committee so when an individual is placed in UNSC resolution 1267 list then asset seizures and international travel ban can be imposed on the particular individual okay this is all about counter terrorist initiatives taken by india during its unsc membership now coming to un peacekeeping see india used its unsc membership to bring the safety related issues of un peacekeeping forces to the forefront india launched the unite aware technology platform to strengthen the real time production of peacekeepers know that unite aware is a type of situational awareness software program that utilizes modern surveillance technology for providing real time threat assessments to un peacekeepers by the introduction of this new technology platform india has shown its commitment to ensure the safety of un peacekeeping forces okay this is all about india's contribution to un peacekeeping forces now moving on to see about the initiatives taken by india to protect the interests of global south in the united nations security council platform see in the month of december 2021 india blocked an attempt by the west to use the arena of unsc for climate change related discussion india expressed its views that unsc as a medium should not be used for discussing climate change related issues the draft resolution moved by the west in this regard was defeated in the council when india and russia voted against the resolution the author feels that india by blocking this resolution has protected the interests of global south see if the particular resolution would have been adopted then the unsc might have garnered the power to discuss the climate change related issues this would have eventually resulted in the discussion of subject of carbon emissions by the developing nations this is why the author feels that india by blocking the resolution has protected the interests of global south and lastly india ended its non permanent membership of the united nations security council by bringing in a discussion relating to the reformation of united nations security council okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about united nations security council then we saw about the structure of united nations security council and finally we saw some points about india's contributions or actions during its two year membership of the united nations security council see this topic is very much important for your both prelims and mains you may have get a question regarding united nations resolution and all so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news in numbers article from the text and context page the article says that the delhi's share of all onorc transactions in india since 2021 is 70 percentage see onorc is nothing but the one nation one ration card scheme nearly 5.21 lakh migrants on average received ration under onorc scheme in 2022-23 this is about the news now in this backdrop let us learn few points about onorc scheme see the one nation one ration card scheme is being implemented under national food security act this scheme allows all national food security act beneficiaries particularly migrant beneficiaries to claim either full or part food grains from any fair price shop in the country through existing ration card with biometric or aadhar authentication in a seamless manner the system also allows their family members back home to claim the balanced food grains on the same ration card so these are the objectives of the scheme 
See the implementation of ONORC was initiated in August 2019. Currently, the ONORC program has been successfully implemented in all states and union territories which making food security portable throughout the country. Okay. Now talking about the benefits of the scheme. Firstly, ONORC scheme enabling right to food. See previously, ration card holders can avail their entitlement of subsidized food grains under the National Food Security Act only from the designated fair price shops within the concerned state. However, if a beneficiary were to shift to another state, he or she would need to apply for a new ration card in the second state. So, ONORC envisages removing the geographical hindrance to social justice and enabling the right to food. Secondly, ONORC scheme supports one third of population. See, nearly 37% of Indian population is of migrant laborers. So, the own ORC scheme is important for anyone who is going to move from one place to another. Thirdly, own ORC scheme reduces leakages. This is because the fundamental prerequisite of the scheme is deduplication. So, this will ensure that the same person does not figure as a beneficiary in two different locations of the country. Further, own ORC scheme is linked with other and biometrics. So, this removes most possibilities of corruption. And finally, ONORC scheme helps in reducing social discrimination. This is because ONORC will be particularly beneficial for women and other disadvantaged groups. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about ONORC scheme, that is One Nation, One Ration Card scheme. Then about the objectives of the scheme. And finally, we saw some benefits associated with ONORC scheme. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article, it says that a Grand Chola Museum will be set up by Tamil Nadu government in Tanjavur. This is to highlight the contribution of the Imperial Chola dynasty and to preserve artifacts and relics. Adding to this, efforts would be taken to promote and support sea cruises that would connect places of significance in Tamil culture. This is about the news article given here. Today in our discussion, let us concentrate on the Imperial Chola part. It will be very useful for our prelims. So pay attention to the discussion. See the history of Cholas falls into two periods. They are the early Cholas of the Sangam age and the rise of medieval Cholas under Vijayalaya. This medieval Chola period is called as Imperial Chola dynasty. As I already said in this discussion we will see about the Imperial Chola dynasty. See around 850 AD Vijayalaya took an opportunity arising out of a conflict between Pandyas and Pallavas. Know that Vijayalaya is a feudatory of the Pallavas. He captured Tanjavur and eventually established the imperial line of the medieval Cholas. So the reign of the Cholas began in the 9th century when they defeated the Pallavas to come into power. See the rule of imperial Cholas stretched for over 5 centuries until the 13th century. The most powerful rulers of this period include Rajaraja Chola and Rajendra Chola. Now if you see the land stretch of the empire. The empire extends across present-day Tamil Nadu, Kerala and parts of Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. The naval supremacy of the Cholas allowed them to conquest lands as far as Malaysia and the Sumatran Islands of Indonesia. Know that the Rashtrakutas of the Deccan and the Chalukyas of the Andhra Pradesh were contemporaries to the Imperial Cholas. Now look at this map here. This map shows the area under Rajendra Chola I, who is one of the most powerful rulers of Imperial Chola dynasty. This is all about the extent of the empire. Now let us see about the administration and governance. Know that Cholas ruled in a sustained monarchy. Here the massive kingdom was divided into province which were known as mandalams. Separate governors were held in charge for each mandalam. These mandalams were further divided into districts called nadus. These nadus consisted of tehsils. See the system of rule was such that each village acted as a self-governing unit during the era of imperial Cholas. This is all about the administration and governance during the Chola period. For information, know that the empire consisted of the current day territories of Tiruchirappalli, Tiruvarur, Perambulur, Ariyalur, Nagapattinam, Pudukottai, Virudachalam, Pichavaram and Tanjavur districts of Tamil Nadu. Now moving on to the cultural part, see art, religion and literature benefited greatly during this period. Several Shiva temples were built across the banks of the Kaveri river. And know that several of these temples have been classified as World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. These include 
the Brigadeshwar Temple, the Gangai Konda Cholishwaram, and the Aidavadishwara Temple. Adding to this, sculpting and art were also at an all time high during this Imperial Chola period. Sculptures of God and Goddess like Shiva, Vishnu, and Lakshmi have been carved out of bronze, and they serve as a golden reminder of this period. Apart from this, literature was another crucial highlight of this Imperial Chola period. The popular Nalaira Divya Prabhadam from this period is a compilation of 4000 Tamil verses and is widely enjoyed by literary scholars even to this day. Along with the devotional writings, Jain and Buddhist writings also got appreciation and recognition during this period. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the Imperial Chola dynasty, then we saw about the extent of the empire, then we saw about the administration and governance of the Imperial Chola dynasty. And finally, we saw some points regarding architecture, literature and sculptures. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims. So, make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this text and context article. This article is talking about the new rules notified by Bar Council of India. See, few days back, the Bar Council of India, that is BCI, notified the rules for registration and regulation of foreign lawyers and foreign law firms in India 2022. These rules will enable foreign lawyers and foreign law firms to practice foreign law in India on a reciprocal basis. Okay, this is the background of the article given here. Now in this discussion, we will understand about the new rules and we will also see how this move is mutually beneficial to Indian and foreign lawyers. Now, before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. Now, first of all, let us see how the rules worked before. See, according to the Advocates Act, only advocates who are enrolled with the Bar Council of India are allowed to practice law in India. For practicing, the lawyers must obtain a license to practice as a lawyer from the BCI. See, all others, like even an litigant, can appear only with the permission of the court, authority or person before whom the proceedings are pending. Here note that even the Indian lawyers are allowed to practice legal professions in India only if the country allows them to do so. In that line, for more than 10 decades, Bar Council of India has been against allowing foreign law firms in India. Consequently, in 2018, Bar Council of India told the Supreme Court that it was not in favour of allowing foreign law firms to open branches in India. Subsequently, the Supreme Court also passed a verdict stating that foreign lawyers and law firms are not allowed to practice law in India unless they meet the requirements. But the recent notification by Bar Council of India is U-turn from this 2018 stance. Now let us see some points about Bar Council of India. See, the Bar Council of India is a statutory body established under the Advocates Act 1961. Bar Council of India work under the Ministry of Law and Justice. The primary mission of the body is to regulate legal professional standards in India. This includes directing the state bar councils, standardizing law education and course framework at the universities and law colleges in India. Apart from this, Bar Council of India also conducts the All India Bar Examination to grant certificate of practice to advocates to practice law in India. BCI also funds welfare schemes for economically weaker and physically handicapped advocates. Okay. Now coming to the recent notification of BCI, see the notification essentially allows foreign lawyers and law firms to register with BCI to practice law in India if they are entitled to practice law in their home countries. However, the foreign lawyers or foreign law firms have not been permitted to appear before any courts, tribunals or other statutory or regulatory authorities. This means that the foreign lawyers and law firms are just allowed to practice foreign law, diverse international law and international arbitration matters in India on the principle of reciprocity in a well-defined, regulated and controlled manner. And know that the foreign lawyers and law firms cannot be allowed to practice Indian law. They are allowed to only practice foreign law, diverse international law and international arbitration matters. Okay? See, these same restrictions are also applicable for Indian lawyers who are working with foreign law firms. See, Indian lawyers working with foreign law firms will be allowed to engage only in non-litigious practice. This means that the Indian lawyers are not allowed to appear before any courts in the foreign country. So, the principle of reciprocity in the rules ensures that it would be mutually beneficial for lawyers from India and abroad. Now, moving on to see about the benefits of BCA rules. 
according to the bca the move will benefit indian lawyers whose legal proficiency standards are similar to international standards since law practice in india is opened up to foreign lawyers in a restricted and regulated manner it will ensure legal fraternity in india secondly the rules would help to address the concerns expressed about the flow of foreign direct investment into the country thirdly by allowing the operation of foreign lawyers and law firms in india the rules would help to make india a hub for international commercial arbitration and finally foreign law firms and lawyers may bring in specialized expertise and international best practices to india so this could improve the overall quality of legal services in india and it can expand the legal job market apart from this the move certainly introduce artificial intelligence based technology into legal service delivery and it also push indian law firms to adopt it okay these are all the advantages associated with the new rules notified by bar council of india despite all these advantages some of the advocates feels that a notification of bci might contribute to the corporatization of legal practice this is because the notification will force the indian law students to move away from litigious practice and encourages them to join in corporate firms as legal advisors thereby this neglects the real need for lawyers in india that is defending and fighting for the rights of the poor okay and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about the rules that was notified by bar council of india for registration and regulation of foreign lawyers and foreign law firms in india then we saw some points about bar council of india and finally we saw some points about the benefits of the notified rules by bar council of india now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now for our next discussion we are going to take this news article see recently the intergovernmental panel on climate change that is ipcc has launched its latest report on the climate crisis see this news article highlights few points from the ipcc report it mainly says that we are rapidly losing an opportunity to limit the heating of earth to over 1.5 degree celsius above the pre industrial levels this particular ipcc report is called as the ar6 synthesis report climate change 2023 This report summarizes the recent 5 years reports on global temperature rises, fossil fuel emissions and climate impacts. Okay? This is the background of the article given here. Now in this discussion, we will see what are all the important findings of this IPCC report. Firstly, the IPCC report says that we have got only limited time to take actions to maintain the livability of our planet. We all know about the Paris Agreement goal, right? The goal is to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This particular report says that limiting the heating to well below 2 degrees Celsius by 2030 will be hard to achieve. But the good news is that we can still work to avoid the 1.5 degree heating. Now you may wonder, there is only a 0.5 degree Celsius gap between the two, that is 2 degree and 1.5 degree Celsius, right? It seems there is not much difference, but rather very fortunately, the difference between 2 degree Celsius and 1.5 degree Celsius is not merely a temperature gap of 0.5 degree Celsius. It means climate risks will be at least two times lesser if we could limit the rise of 1.5 degree Celsius. Now you can see the difference in this chart. See, if we limit the heating by 1.5 degrees Celsius, there is only 3 percentage impact on crop yield. But if the temperature rises by 2 degree, then there will be 7 percentage impact. So, crossing this 1.5 degrees Celsius mark means we are entering a danger zone, and there will be irreversible impacts on the ecosystem. As I already said, we are not too late to avoid this from happening. we can still work to limit the rise by 1.5 degree celsius okay in addition to this the report says that the problem here is lack of any meaningful action so this inaction will cost us so much and it will impact everyone from governments to companies and families the report also finds that nearly half of the world's population live in this danger zone of climate impacts therefore the lives and livelihoods are under threat from more frequent and intense extreme weather events such as flooding and drought and this in turn will have an impact on food and water security and it will also lead to loss of vital natural ecosystems apart from this the report also talks about climate justice now what is this climate justice 
see the impacts of climate change is not being born equally or fairly between rich and poor women and men and older and younger generations when a flood comes the poor suffer more see climate justice is a concept which acknowledges that climate change can have differing social economic public health and other adverse impacts on underprivileged populations so climate justice is crucial because those who have contributed least to climate change are being disproportionately affected okay so the ipcc report talks about this climate justice and finally the report underscores the urgency of taking more ambitious action it says that if we act now we can still secure a livable sustainable future for all okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the recently released ipcc report on climate crisis see you can use these points while writing your main answer this will definitely enrich your answer so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article it reports about a recent maha panchayat organized by the samyukt kishan morcha now that samyukt kishan morcha is a coalition of over 40 indian farmers union which was formed in the year 2020 to coordinate satyagraha against three farm acts see samyukt kisan morcha has organized this maha panchayat to appeal to the union government to introduce a law guaranteeing minimum support price the other demands include the immediate waiver of all loans of all farmers then reduction in input prices and withdrawal of electricity amendment bill okay this is what is given in this article now using this as an opportunity let us quickly revise about minimum support price in prelims perspective see minimum support price is a type of price guarantee offered by the union government for the produce of the farmers see it is the minimum price at which the produce of the farmers is acquired by the government now that minimum support price for a crop is announced each year before the sowing season now how minimum support price is fixed see minimum support price is fixed by the union government based on the recommendations of commission for agricultural costs and prices that is cacp know that cacp functions under the ministry of agriculture i have provided here the determinants considered by cacp while fixing the msp of a crop pass the video and go through it it should be noted that cost of production is an important factor that goes as an input in determination of minimum support price but the cost of production is certainly not the only factor that determines msp okay this is all about the determinants of minimum support price Now talking about the crops which are covered under MSP, see MSP covers both the Karif and Ravi season crops. As of now, MSP covers 23 commodities which includes seven cereals, five pulses, seven oil seeds, and four commercial crops. Here I have provided the crops covered under MSP. Pass the video and go through it. Okay, this is all about the crops which are covered by MSP in India. Know that sugar cane in India is covered under a different price guarantee scheme called the fair and remunerative price, that is FRP. See, FRP is notified by the central government each year after consultation with state governments and sugar mills. Okay, that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about minimum support price. Then we saw about the determinants of minimum support price, and finally we saw some points about the crops that are covered under MSP. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article the news is that the supreme court has directed the government to pay the arrears to the ex servicemen of the armed forces under the one rank one pension scheme this is about the news article given here now in this context let us learn about the one rank one pension scheme from an exam perspective see the one rank one pension scheme which is shortly known as OROP scheme was introduced by the government in the year 2015 despite the scheme was introduced in 2015 The scheme came into effect retrospectively from July 1st 2014 with 2013 as a base year. See under the OROP scheme a uniform pension is paid to the armed forces personnel retiring at the same rank with the same length of service regardless of their date of retirement. Before OROP scheme the ex servicemen used to get pensions as per the pay commission's recommendations of the time when they had retired. Now I will explain to you with an example. Imagine a person A serves in the Indian Army for 15 years from 1975 to 1990 and he retires as a non-commissioned officer. Now according to the old pension scheme, A's pension would be based entirely on their last drawn salary. We can also say that A's pension would be based on the pay commission prevailing at that time. 
Now consider a person B serves in the army for 10 years from 2010 to 2020 and retires as a non-commissioned officer. See here also the pension of B would be dependent on her last drawn salary as like A. But the problem here is that B would be getting a much bigger pension than the person A. This is simply because of the increasing costs and standard of living and also due to concurrent increases in salaries due to pay scale revision. So the differences would be great, right? So OROP aims to rectify this problem by giving all retired armed forces personnel a uniform pension who retired at the same rank with the same age of service regardless of when they served and retired. Note that armed forces personnel who had retired till 30th June 2014 are covered under one rank one pension scheme. And know that the implementation of the scheme was based on the recommendations of the Koshiari committee. Now why this particular scheme had introduced for armed forces alone? See unlike civilian employees who retire at 16 years of age, military personnel retire much earlier. So if we follow the pay commission recommendations, it widens the gap between the pension that is paid out to someone who retired earlier and the one who retired later. So the personnel who retired early will get only less amount of pension compared with one who retires later. So keeping these aspects in mind, the government came up with the one rank one pension scheme. Okay? And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about one rank one pension scheme. Then we saw about the motive behind the introduction of one rank one pension scheme. And finally, we saw some points about why one rank one pension scheme had introduced the FAR armed forces alone. Now with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now look at this first question. This question is regarding Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Let's take up the first statement. It is a joint Russian-Chinese attempt to maintain peace in the Central Asian region. Actually this statement is correct. Shanghai Cooperation Organization was created to maintain peace in the Central Asian region. So statement 1 is correct. Now look at this second statement. Sri Lanka is an observer state to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. See this statement is incorrect because Sri Lanka is given the status of dialogue partner and not observer status. So statement 2 is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, the SCO's regional anti-terrorist structure that is RATS is based in Beijing. See this statement is also incorrect because RATS is based in Tashkent and not in Beijing. So third statement is also incorrect. So the correct answer for the question is option A one only. Moving on, let's take up the second question. I'll read out the question. Momentum for change, climate neutral now is an initiative launched by. See here, four options are given. We have to choose. This initiative was launched by which of the following organizations? See, the UNFCCC Secretariat launched climate neutral now initiative in 2015. It is an initiative launched to urge individuals, companies and governments to measure their climate footprint and urges them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. So the correct answer for the question is option C, the UNFCCC Secretariat. Moving on, let's take up the third question. This question is regarding minimum support price. This question was asked in 2020 UPSC prelims. Let's take up the first statement. In the case of all cereals, pulses and oil seeds, the procurement at minimum support price is unlimited in any state or union territory of India. See this statement is incorrect because the procurement is open-ended but it is not unlimited in any state or union territory of India. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now look at the second statement. In the case of cereals and pulses, the minimum support price is fixed in any state or union territory at level to which the market price will never rise. See this statement is incorrect because the market price of cereal and pulses does not always remain below the level of MSP. So statement 2 is incorrect. Here the question is asking for correct statement. So the correct answer for the question is option D neither one nor two. Now let's take up the final question. This question is regarding one nation one ration card scheme. Now look at the first statement. It aims to implement the National Food Security Act through nationwide portability. See this statement is correct. As we saw in the discussion, one nation one ration card scheme aims to implement National Food Security Act through nationwide seamless portability. So statement one is correct. Now look at the second statement. Mera Ration mobile app provides real time information to the beneficiaries and is available in all 22 scheduled languages. See this statement is incorrect because the government has rolled out the Mera Ration mobile application to take maximum advantage of the own ORC plan. The mobile app provides a host of useful real time information to the beneficiaries and the information is available in 13 languages and not all 22 scheduled languages. So statement 2 is not correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A 1 only. 
This is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in your community section. Try to answer it. And don't worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify it. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.